good afternoon, everyone. And uh, well, this is people who are concerned with the Chinese economy is worrying about the Japanization or Japanification of the Chinese economy. So uh, Japanification means the the uh, collapse of uh, financial bu bubble and uh, destructed stagnation afterwards. And so uh, it uh, will harm the its long-term economic growth. Is it okay now? Okay. Yeah. No and but uh, I would like to discuss the uh, long-term growth patterns of Chinese economy. And uh, of course, it uh, it has much to do with the the worry about the uh, Japanification or Japanization of the Chinese economy. But uh, let me start. Um, first, the main story is abstracted like this. The first, despite her unprecedentedly high and sustained economic growth uh, in the past three decades, China has been repeatedly expected to uh, face possibly sudden growth slowdown eventually. And we exam I examine her growth pattern as income catching up processes as those in East Asia analyzing it in the conventional framework of neoclassical neo economic growth. So this is, this, it sounds very textbook like. Uh, based on an internationally comparable macroeconomic database, so called Penn World Table 1001. Uh, we find that her growth in Chinese growth pattern is exceptional, but very parallel with forerunners in East Asia like Korea, Taiwan, uh, even Japan. And that her growth is still in, uh, in an early stage so that her catch up could be sustained without significant growth slowdown. Of course that um, could. So uh, I, I don't say can, but could. We can't say for the future, for sure. Introduction, start from uh, what has been said about uh, this theme. China's growth, well, one is one representative uh, expression is that, the, that made by uh, Prasad, 2023. China's growth over the last few decades stands out as a positive historical anomaly, abnormal by any measures. And uh, several explanation, possible explanation occurred, like uh, mean reversion by Pritchett Summers, the middle income trap by Karas in Dermit, other models, those are used for many years to predict an imminent slowdown or decline in economic growth. And uh, often, mentioned uh, Chinese low level of the financial and institutional development, state-dominated state economy, non-democratic government, and other inadequacies for marketing mechanism to work out should have dragged down growth eventually. So uh, the first and the most important question is, is the much anticipated and long foretold day of reckoning finally at hand? It's a little bit bad. Some side evidence is that first of all, the, uh, it, this figure, figure one shows GDP and the GDP per capita of China in comparison with the uh, United States. And this shows the GDP itself. This shows the uh, GDP per capita. And I, I well, it, it's a little bit cumbersome, but uh, let's see. You see, if we take the market exchange rate, the uh, Chinese GDP uh, was close to 80% uh, of United States in 2021. If we take the PPP purchasing per parity exchange rate, it go beyond went beyond in 2015. 
that of the United States. But of course, if we take the uh, per capita GDP, it's uh, more or less 20% of the United States counterpart. And actually, if we look at the GDP and the per capita GDP growth rates of China, since 1990 through 2022, we see uh, several well measures here, official figures and uh, pen world table figures. But uh, in both cases, we see some declining trend since the world uh, global exchange, I'm sorry, global financial crisis. Some, some downward trend. And uh, two types of worries. The, the first kind of worries is that um, uh, the emerging vulnerabilities, uh, lower private investment and higher private debt. Stagnant what? Stagnant what? Can't see. Invest, sorry, TFP. Total factor productivity. Too high household saving and deposits. And uh, declining population, especially working age population. And these are emerging vulnerabilities these days, but um, it remains, I mean, that the weak fundamental remains or persists, like underdeveloped financial sector, underdeveloped corporate governance, and other weak market institutions. So worries, two types of emergent worries and the fundamental worries come from these factors. So um, usual assertions are China's growth over the last five decades has been spectacular and unique in recent history. Having said that, it has done all of this without a well-functioning financial system, a strong institutional framework, a market-oriented economy, or a democratic and open system to government, free from it, without these uh, basic uh, fundamentals. But if the government's goal is to sustain growth, it needs to find ways to improve the allocation of resources within the economy and enhance productivity growth. So that um, uh, well done so far without the market, fundamental, market fundamentals, but it needs to be remedied. It needs to be uh, transformed the growth what, uh, frameworks. And uh, so I start from the uh, observation of China's growth has been exceptionally spectacular in recent history. I will deny it. Well, simply, this shows the, how many countries? Probably more than 100 the per capita GDP relative to US during the period of 1950 to 2019. And uh, it starts from here, United States. United States is the, uh, uh, the model or standard so that um, uh, it's a uh, per capita GDP stays at one. Sorry, it's very small, but so the horizontal line at the, at the level of one. And this is Japan, this is Taiwan, this is uh, Korea, and China is this. China's growth performance relative to United States is this. So we are looking at the recent three decades, 1990 through 2020, at the end of this uh, curve. And uh, we can observe various patterns of relative per capita GDP. So uh, apparently, uh, there is no homogeneous pattern. Some are catching up, like in the case of uh, Taiwan, Korea, China, lately. But it's not normal. It's not standard. Generally, we can see the, the, the ne negative trend here. Divergence from the per capita GDP of the United States 
and can't figure out which country this is. But this is not exceptional. There are, there are many diverging countries. And diverging, converging, converging, and diverging. So several types. But um, uh, common feature among these East Asian high rapid growing economy, Japan used to be, and Taiwan still, Korea and China. This is the, they are exceptional. But not only China. If we compare more exactly the performance of per capita GDP, uh, it takes the per capita GDP and we rearrange those four East Asian economies, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, from the starting point of uh, about $2,825 per capita at the start. And we rearrange it so remarkably. It coincided cl very closely. It's the years from the zero, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Particularly in the beginning of the first 30 years, we see the very close movement of across four East Asian economies. If we transpose it into a usual time series data, then we can detect this. This is United States per capita GDP. And this is Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and China. And uh, because this is the what log, so the slope shows the, the economic growth rates. We can see the almost parallel growth pattern here in the recent period of China. That's why we will have uh, this uh, duplication. So uh, it's a very simple evidence. China's growth is not unprecedentedly spectacular. It's spectacular, but it's not. There are many precedents. In view of growth experience in East Asia in the last six decades, China's rapid growth in the last three decades is as spectacular and exceptional as its prior or forerunners in East Asia among emerging market economies, but rather not unprecedented nor unique. And now we are going to put China in view of a neoclassical growth model, very textbook like. Let's suppose that the production function or uh, aggregate GDP can be explained by labor input and uh, non labor input called capital. And uh, unexplained productivity growth, TFP. Then the neoclassical neo growth model that was a major product of uh, uh, deceased uh, Professor Solo last year, or last year. Yeah. And uh, his original paper was uh, 1957, so 56, sorry. I quoted it later on. And uh, this is uh, one of the first papers we learned in our graduate students' book in the, what, uh, 1960s, late 1960s. No, no, so sorry, 70s, early 1970s. But anyway, so it's the same, long-lived. <laughs> and uh, say, uh, assuming the uh, Cobb Douglas type, constant returns to scale, then Y of L, GDP, or well, this is a labor, labor productivity, can be expressed like this. A stands for TFP, and theta stands for capital income share. It's about, say, one third in the case of uh, advanced economies. 
but it varies across countries. In per capita terms with population N, we can divide by N and we come up with uh, small y equals A, small k, and small L. L is a uh, labor over population, so that um, we call it uh, labor participation. So this is the, the first uh, framework we start with. And this table shows the per capita GDP uh, normalizing the US capital per capita GDP and the US per capita capital stock in 2019 as one. So in the case of the United States, GDP per capita GDP one in 2019, capital stock one. If we look at the United States figures for 1960, its per capita GDP was 0 0.3, capital stock 0 0.3, and the cap per capita GDP in 1990, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Likewise, out on also, we, we take it that uh, US TFP in 19, 2019 as one, so the TFP level is like this. Like this, if we took the Japan as an example, Japan's uh, level of per capita GDP in 1960 is 0 0.08 as to US 2019, 0 0.07 per capita capital stock as to US 2019, etc. Then in the case of China, here, 2019, China's per capita GDP, according to the, uh, the, the uh, pain world table, is 0 0.22 of the United States 2019, 0 0.33 uh, per capita stock, capital stock, and TFP 0.4. 1960, the smaller than that. So uh, those those are well, normalized figures can be expressed in the usual production function, like this. Production function take the take the form of this one. This one. Then we can draw the U U.S. 29 production function. This U.S. Uh, 1990 production function this, China is this, and this. And uh, so our pinpoint, I mean, say in the case of the United States, one, one, one in 2019 can be here, fuck up the capital stock one and the per capita GDP one here. So that this is the this is the US location in 2019. It used to be here in 1990. Right? So that the um, US economy transition from here to here. Likewise in the case of like, China from here, around here, to here, and uh, Taiwan, uh, somewhere here, to here. Horizontal distance shows the capital stock increase per capita. And the vertical gap shows TFP growth in, in terms of this framework. So uh, we can see both, not, not both. I, I didn't express the Japan case here, but um, three East Asian economies shows that um, they are more capital accumulation oriented than TFP growth. So in view of the conventional neoclassical growth model, China's growth has been heavily dependent on capital accumulation rather than on TFP growth. However, the pace of capital accumulation in Korea and Taiwan has gone beyond China's. The horizontal distance between 
1990 and uh, 2019 is a very, very, very long disappointment. Resulting in their income convergence to the United States. Well, of course, at, um, at the same time, the TFP growth, which is exceptional among emerging market economies, like in the, in the case of the, the many countries you are picture. What's the driver's growth? I said that the capital accumulation is very important rather than TFP. To what extent? So we decompose the growth according to the production function. So in this case, long run growth between zero and T like 1990 to 2019, then we can decompose it like this. This is the TFP growth. Then capital accumulation. Then this is the change of uh, labor participation, employment over total population. At the same time, we have to think about the parameter change, like uh, capital income share. If we allow for parameter change of uh, capital income share, then it will come up like this. So the change is proportional to the most recent capital stock level. Again, this is the labor participation too. How large are they, these uh, parametric change? Oh, let me, let me repeat the contribution of GDP growth can be decomposed into five factors. TFP growth, capital accumulation, labor participation, and capital share change times capital accumulation level, capital share change times labor participation level in the, in the, in the most recent period. This shows the parametric change. Capital income share across four economies, US, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and China. We can see the upward trend with capital income share. In the case of uh, United States, it's, it's a little bit small, but um, about uh, a bit rather than, uh, larger than 35% to uh, almost 40%. Large change can be found in the case of uh, what, uh, Korea. It starts from 35 through almost 50, yeah. We see some, some queer movement in the case of Taiwan. And also we must point out that, um, well, what is this horizontal part? This is lack of, uh, lack of uh, annual data. So it's a, it must be some uh, uh, average figure for this total period up here. And also, we see some shortcomings as to uh, Taiwanese data, but um, well, this is a minus, so let's skip it. But anyway, we see the upper trend in capital income share. The second point, labor participation. This is also going up significantly. So that um, uh, I think it's a uh, fruitful to consider these uh, parametric changes too, if we decompose economic growth. And we end up with this figure. And well, in the case of the 1960s through 19, from the period of, uh, no, no, sorry, from 1960 to 1990, in this period, United States GDP growth per capita is 2.4%. Or 2.5%. Out of them, TFP growth is 0 0.8. Capital accumulation, 0. Uh, almost 8 percent. Labor participation is this. In the most, most recent uh, three decades, GDP growth per capita is 1.6. Out of them, TFP explains 0 0.5. Capital accumulation, this, this. And uh, note that 
this capital share change to capital of contribute significantly. And uh, they are almost negligible. Capital share change uh, times the labor participation change. So, or labor participation. So that um, uh, this shows that in the case of the United States, TFP growth contribution to uh, GDP per capita is about one third. And uh, the other one third can be found by capital accumulation per C plus capital share change to capital. In the case of China, the most recent one, 1999-29, per capita growth is about uh, 6%, 0 0.056, 0 uh, 0.059, so that um, about 6%. TFP growth, 1.6%. Capital accumulation, 4%. So if we made up a graph of decomposition, this is the final, final result for United States. Yeah. And red is the capital accumulation. This, uh, well, it's a flag-like illustration stands for TFP growth. And uh, another another red uh, well well uh, design here is capital share change to capital. So if we combine this uh, capital accumulation contribution and uh, the contribution by capital share change to capital, then we see that capital accumulation is very important. Well, say Taiwan is a little bit different. But um, it's it's probably because of the uh, the capital shares measurement problem. So let's forget about Taiwan here. Looking at the Korea and uh, China, well, it suggests that decomposition suggests even in United States, capital accumulation, including additional effect of capital share increase has contributed to per capita GDP growth more than TFP growth in 1960 through 2019. In East Asia, capital accumulation has dominated in per capita GDP growth, helping them catching up with US in the same period. It means that in the case of Japan, well, the, the, the uh, 1960 through 1990, the capital accumulation and uh, capital share increase played a significant role. China, in both periods, but uh, we are concerned with the uh, more recent one here, the capital accumulation played a significant role. Of course, that, um, we don't deny that some significant contribution by TFP growth. Why capital accumulation dominates TFP growth in this uh, framework? Well, is this is uh, one. Uh, one uh, uh, simple uh, example of uh, application of production function here. We take up the hypothetical transition without TFP growth in the case of China here is one. Why, why China is that? Now? We take up the, uh, uh, the parametric values uh, close to the, the reality, like uh, theta, the capital income share, 0.45, and uh, saving rate or investment rate is 0.4. And assuming no population growth, no TFP growth, and uh, we start from 1990 until uh, 30 years later, 29 years later, for, for example. This uh, blue line shows a per capita GDP uh, level. And the uh, red dotted line is a capital output ratio. What it shows is that um, it starts from 1990 with this uh, uh, probable uh, parametric values. The per capita income will be a little less than four times 
larger than 30 years before. Actually, this is the actual pattern at the actual figures from one up to uh, almost six times larger. So that, of course, that um, this reflects not only the capital accumulation, but also the TFP growth. This is only capital accumulation. And usually, why TFP growth is regarded as more important than capital accumulation is that capital is under the decreasing returns to scale. Sorry, yeah, decreasing returns. So that um, uh, capital accumulations like uh, like uh, uh, approach to the steady state defined by production function. So if we don't see any TFP growth, this movement is along the production line, production function, and uh, it's a it's a transition to a steady state defined by this production function. And we can we can calculate the the, the uh, steady state as steady state capital output ratio will be eight. So um, uh, it's very re remote from here. You see, well, thirty years after nineteen ninety, the Capital output ratio is about five. It's going to going up until eight. But um, well, if we extend this one, it takes more than one hundred years. So that economy would almost never reach the steady state with no negative TF growth. It's very remote. Actually, rate of return, actual rate of return on capital is this. Although we see the, the, the significant decline of uh, rate of return on capital in the case of China, if we look at the liquid uh, case of the United States, the black one here, they showed significant upward trend. Of course, this, this includes the total effect, not only capital accumulation, but also the uh, TFP. We made sure that um, uh, without, TFP, without TFP growth, diminishing returns are very slow. So if we add, in reality, the TFP growth, it could be have positive, positive trend return rate of return on capital so that capital, capital accumulation is the engine of growth so yeah i i already said that the rate of return on capital may diminish but very slowly with non-zero technology progress, actual rate of returns on capital may not necessarily fall in the long run, as in the case of the United States. Now, finally, growth prospects. So, sticking to this uh, neoclassical growth framework, actual growth paths are not a transition toward a steady state combination of say y asterisk k asterisk k s asterisk defined by one time production function production function shifts probably forever but a shift to well this is not a not a simple transition to the steady state but a brand new point shift to a brand new point y and y and k attained by the new every time new production function through endogenous factor accumulation and other changes including parameters and others can be explained 
or are defined as T growths. Of course, actual growth paths expose some turbulences due to macroeconomic shock. This shows the uh, economic growth path, actual economic growth path between, uh, for the period 1950 to 2019 of four economies, four, yeah, yeah, five economies United States, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, China. Within the framework of neoclassical neo growth, GDP per capita on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis capital stock per capita. Well, this I think I think this is fascinating. This is United States. This blue line from here to here. 1950 level is very high, both in capital accumulation and uh, GDP per capita. And the total transition is very short, but steep. And uh, during the same period, Chinese transitions from here to here, I I'm not very confident that uh, the figures for this are very, very accurate or not. But anyway, for well, it's a, it spans over the long range of capital stock accumulation, and uh, so it seems that if we concentrate on the, this figure, the, the United States transitions sh uh, appears short, but very dense. Other East Asian economies, they are transition accompanied by the capital accumulation, very rapid capital accumulation. So that this is long, like in the case of Japan, this is Japan, the green one. And uh, we see very little turbulence in the case of the United States. But if we look at, uh, uh, say, East Asian country like Japan, there is a big kink here. And uh, Korea here and here. Taiwanese case here. Again, again, uh, Taiwan is a li little bit uh, well precise because of the, uh, the 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 capital income share program measurement programs. So if we observe this actual economic growth path in this uh, neoclassical growth framework, uh, uh, maybe I pick up some some questions so far. Well, it's too late. Okay. So, 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 uh, the the I I'm I'm going to uh, to to the prospects of the Chinese economy, and uh, in this framework, what we should do is to to presume the some exogenous variables, uh, some 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 levels like uh, TFP growth and uh, labor participation and uh, capital income share and saving rate or, or investment rate and depreciation. And so uh, to, to simplify the story, I just assume that um, labor participation constant as this, as, as the present, and depreciation, depreciation 0 0.05. And we pick up three scenarios for TFP, uh, Chinese past records of 0 0.68, uh, sorry, 0 0.68 percent. Japanese case 0 0.99. Taiwanese case 1.44. Any could be, and also two two cases for higher and the lower capital income share and the saving rate. Then we come up with various scenarios. Remember that um, uh, United States TFP growth this period is 0 
zero point five percent, and uh, the in the in the in the first thirty three decades zero point eight percent or something like that. And we assume against this Chinese TFP growth, Japanese TFP growth, Taiwan's TFP growth for nine, the period of 1990 to 2019. And we come up with this. This is a China's per capita GDP prospected as a ratio to United States counterpart. And we assume that the US keep increasing, keep growing at 0.02. This is the historical average over the past 130 years of the United States. So it grows, let's say, suppose at 2% a year. And we, we, uh, Take two two story lower capital share case and higher capital share case. This is the actual figure, and uh, lower investment rate case and higher investment case. And what would be like in the year twenty fifty? Pessimistic case is the capital share point, share zero point three five investment rate zero point three, then the Chinese per capita GDP will be 36.6% uh, of the United States in 2050. But it decreased since then up to uh, year 2,100 to 24%. Uh, so uh, it's, it failed to catch up. This is the most, most Pessimistic case. And the most optimistic case is that um, they keep on high capital share and high investment share and uh, pick up the Taiwanese like uh, high TFP growth. Then by 2050, it reaches 70% of US per capita GDP level. And by 20, uh, 2100, almost equal. And uh, prior studies, uh, like, uh, like what? So, like by this, this paper, Fernandez Viraverde, Jesus, sorry, Fernandez Viraverde and Ohanian and Yao paper, well, they also use the uh, neoclassical growth type, but um, they presume that the TFP growth of China is uh, limited by seeding up to 40% uh, 40, 40 of the, 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 the uh, US TFP level. So they cap it so that um, they, they draw a rather pessimistic scenario for the future uh, prospect of Chinese growth, but um, there is no reason why we we uh, well impose this uh, ceiling in the case of TFP growth in China. It depends. It it depends on the policy management. Depends on the world economy growth and etc. So that um, if we are free from these uh, constraints, then there could be a very negative scenario of uh, divergence to very positive scenario of uh, convergence. But of course, this is a, this is a very simple well, exercise. My concluding remarks is this. In view of some growth experiences in East Asia in the past six decades, China's rapid economic growth in the past three decades is comparable, but not unprecedented. In view of neoclassical growth model, China's growth is heavily dependent on capital accumulation rather than TFP growth, which is also the characteristics of the East Asian growth, resulting in exceptional income convergence with advanced economies such as the United States. In view of growth paths, 
these economies in East Asia started from a far lower level of GDP and capital stock than US and attained, her 1990, attained US 1990 income level by the early 21st century through very rapid capital accumulation with significant TFP growth. During the process, they successfully maintained high capital efficiency during the process and closely followed the US growth path, where if we look at this uh, K, K -way, Y diagram, which China appears to follow too. Well, well you, may, you may see some, some, some problems, well, that we see some, some gap between here, the United States and the Chinese, uh, and also we uh, worrying, some, some worrisome uh, observations that we see some, some kink here, from around here, probably reflects the, the, the recent worries about the uh, uh, trend decline of the uh, investment rate as well as economic growth. Anyway, and uh, but uh, generally, China appears to follow this East Asian pattern of uh, convergence, noting that uh, China's foreigners in East Asia started their rapid growth also from low level of financial and institutional development, state dominated economy, non democratic government, and other inadequacies. There is no reason for China to mean revert among developing economies as a whole, but some reason to sustain her income convergence through her own transformation, just like her foreigners have done so, have done so far. Finally, where we can draw various future prospects, nobody can tell, for sure, for China's economic growth, whether medium round slowdowns of rapid economic growth observed in East Asia since, since 1990s are structural, or cyclical appears to be an intriguing theme to be pursued for the future in the economic growth literature. Okay, I stop here. Uh, first sensei, thank you very much. Uh, based on growth accounting approach here and the time series data, uh, Professor Posa uh, explained the reason of the, the process of China's economic growth and other and some other kind of East Asia economies, I think we can learn a lot from this presentation. So now we we have uh, enough time for discussion. Any question or comments are welcome. Uh, when you ask question, uh, please uh, first say your name and your application, please. Ah, uh, Sensei. Thank you very much, uh, Kosa Kosente. Uh, I enjoyed uh, your presentation and it was very, very fascinating. And uh, I agree to you most of the uh, results and the analysis. The particularly um, capital accumulation uh, or capital formation is a source of economic development. A long time ago, uh, T.W. Schultz, uh, who is a uh, um, Nobel uh, uh, laureate in 1979. Uh, he says, uh, uh, looking at uh, people in uh, developing countries, they are poor but efficient. This means that the lacking is uh, capital and other resources uh, than uh, labor. Mm. So the uh, source of the capital is uh, definitely the source of uh, economic development. If we look at, uh, you know, uh, I used to say that uh, mm -hmm. to the student. Okay, uh, let's consider two students uh, who have the same ability, but one student have only handy calculator. The other one is uh, with computer. Uh, if it would be free. Study and combination. Uh, in that case, uh, the uh, capital the, to increase the income and the labor productivity, uh, capital accumulation is most, most uh, very, very important. And the, uh, in that sense, uh, you, you said and you analyzed very, very clear, uh, clearly 
to be the source of the uh, economic development in uh, uh, Asian countries. Is the uh, source of the uh, uh, sorry the capital uh, formation or capital accumulation. Uh, it's a very uh, clear and enjoy. Uh, and my question is that, uh, uh, however, some way of capital accumulation mm. is a little bit different mm. among uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China. In case of uh, Japan. Most of the source of capital was the safe, domestic safe, the, particularly in early stage of economic development. Developed. If we consider the uh, Meiji era rather than after, our, after the second world mm -hmm. period, the, uh, most capital was uh, the uh, from the uh, tax and some uh, uh, savings mm -hmm. uh, from uh, uh, landlord mm -hmm. and some uh, very uh, rich people. So, so that the, uh, in the, uh, as that case, say, uh, not much inflow uh, as an uh, direct investment. But it, this, this could be uh, applied to the, uh, some degree to uh, Taiwan, Korea. But in the case of uh, China, the most of the uh, uh, capital is uh, incoming from uh, other countries as uh, direct inv investment. So the, if we uh, some uh, uh, additional um, consideration on the uh, Chinese uh, uh, future, the source of the capital that is now the uh, mostly direct uh, investment. That could be a very stable or uh, uh, sustainable. And this is my question. Mm. So the uh, your conclusion is right. However, in the future, the source of the capital mm. uh, is, uh, I wonder. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. May may I answer one by one or we we correct first of one by one uh, first okay one by one. I I have very close sympathy about your observation about the source of uh, saving or source of investment funds, but um I presume no no uh, my I uh, think Chinese. Saving mobilization is about similar with other East Asian economies like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, in, in the sense that um, they heavily depend on domestic saving. And you mentioned about the importance of the FDI, but um, uh, uh, this is my not very exact observation, but um, foreign saving. I have never seen the successful case dependent successful case of growth dependent on foreign saving including fdi and of course that fdi is very important in the case of china especially through technology transfer but then uh, major major well financing financing uh, well uh constraint is concerned domestic saving is the, the real source of uh, investment, not foreign savings. It's not uh, reliable. And uh, in the case, of, even in the case of China, they don't uh, heavily depend on the, on the uh, foreign savings. So as far as the, so that, um, uh, current account balance is concerned, they are almost in, 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 in black not red. And of course, they, they absorb some, uh, well, uh, foreign direct investment and uh, learn the governance, learn the technology, but um, th it's not the, the evidence of uh, they are dependent on foreign savings. So that um, I see no distinction between Chinese, Chinese sources funds 
of investment and other East Asian tigers. Maybe <laughs> you may have uh, another another views, but um, I think that um, uh, without domestic the Chinese savings are very high, too high probably, and uh, we might uh, discuss about uh, the efficiency, the use of domestic saving, mostly by the uh, state or state uh, enterprises and uh, uh, undistributed uh, dividends, so that. Um, uh, but household savings are also important. And it, it is common with the East Asian economies. And uh, we are talking about uh, too much household saving and uh, efficiency of the use of the saving. But um, we can't deny the importance of the domestic saving rather than the foreign savings. Even though we admit the, the importance, the significance Play, uh, significant role played by the foreign direct investment, but it's not a substitute for domestic saving, is my view. Uh, let me add a, a related information. Actually, in the initial stage, I think uh, FDI is a very important a part of capital accumulation. But in recent year, actually, the outward FDI from China is larger than inward. Uh, it means the importance is degree in terms of uh, capital, capital, uh, capital accumulation. Of course, if we consider the technology transformation and uh, market know how, uh, FDI still is very important. But if we look, consider the importance of capital, capital accumulation, its importance is degree. Because the outward FDI from China is like, may, may I add okay. one, one more thing? No, no, no. I, I, I can be picked up. Well, I suppose that um, uh, if you say so, probably Taiwan is more similar to a Chinese case. They are they relied more on uh, foreign direct investment, but it's not the the as a as a source of source of uh, investment fund, but the technology. And uh, Korea and Japan, they are very. Uh, reluctant to accept the foreign direct investment. But actually, well, in, in these days, Japan is abhorred by the foreign capital <laughs> because, because of the J J Japanese capital itself is going out. So, so nobody's coming in. But anyway, anyway we're, we're very little dependent on, on the uh, foreign direct investment is uh, common in Korea and Japan, but, but not in Taiwan case. Oh, we have the Professor Horioka uh, raising his hand. Horioka-sensei, oh. do know. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 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 hello, Professor uh, Kosaka. It's uh, oh, good to oh. see you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry I couldn't uh, join you in person, but I'm uh, joining you from uh, yeah, yeah, the Kansai area. <laughs> okay. And uh, I wanted yeah. to thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. And... Um, I also agree with most of your findings, uh, uh, in particular that the capital accumulation uh, played an important role in China's economic growth. And also, uh, I agree that you know the domestic uh, saving was the most important source of the funds. And I think that uh, maybe the household saving was especially important because I know household saving was very high, uh, has been very high in China. So. Uh, of course, you need the saving in order to do the investment. So I think this high household saving played an important role. And um, I was just wondering uh, about your views about why household saving has been so high, maybe too high, as you suggested, uh, even though, you know, income levels uh, in the past were quite low. How, why were households able to, to save so much? Do you have some ideas about that? No, 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 it's it, your expertise. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Actually, we see, uh, well, generally speaking, it's a pre precautionary motive. For the future, for example, in, in the old ages, and some uncertainty in the future. So this is, this is, this is the field of uh, household, household behavior on saving. And so I have no no better idea than yours, <laughs> but um, uh, exceptionally high, yes. 
and uh, misuse or inefficient inefficiency of allocation of these uh, ample funds for investment is another uh, topic. Probably uh, they are less less efficiently used in the case of China in comparison with the Korea and Taiwan or Japan in their early, say, uh, rapid growth period of the beginning of the third years. Mm, Do you think I... so? Yeah, I see. And uh, do you have any uh, idea about like the future trends in the uh, uh, saving in China? Do you think it will remain high or do you think it will uh, come down due to, for example, some demographic changes? I see, I see no reason to, to for the household savings to going down because oh. you have they have more worries. <laughs> the the very possible bubble burst, very possible slowing down because of the uh, rather rigid uh, economic policy management, so that uh, they they have uh, ample ample. Uh, but uh, motivation to 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 rush into a precautionary savings, you know, that that's my observation. But um, how how do you think? Oh well, uh, yeah, I think you you could be right, but uh, maybe uh, due to the aging of the population, that may lead to you know eventually to some decline in the saving rate. Uh, I didn't mention much about the, uh, the, the demographic transition, but um, uh, in the case of China, probably we see the declining trend of uh, working age population share. That, that's how, to, how, how much they, they affect negatively to the future growth of it. China is a more, more intriguing thing, one of the very intriguing things. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention much about uh, labor participation here, because I, I, I assume it's a constant, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's it's too 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 probably optimistic to to talk about the future trend of Chinese growth. I see. Right. 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 Okay. Thank you very very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I, I'm not in the field. I, I think it's your statement. Uh, so, as you mentioned, you have to go to the can, can you speak a little bit louder? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, capital accumulation plays an important part in uh, GDP growth. Mm. But uh, from your point of view, uh, which part of accumulation? I mean, sorry, from uh, so what drives the most of the capital accumulation? I think so there are a lot of uh, investments on uh, real estate these in recent years, and also uh, I'm not sure if there's a lot of uh, capital accumulation. From... Co content of uh, contents of capital accumulation? Yeah, yeah. Can, can you... or, 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 or composition? Com uh, yeah, composition of capital uh, accumulation. Uh, uh, uh. So which part do you think is the most uh, important part in, uh, 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 in contributing to the uh, capital accumulation? Uh, uh. So for example, recent years, we uh, have observed uh, um, in capital investment on real estate. Uh, and I don't know if there are much on uh, investment on uh, manufacturing uh, sector, uh, which I think uh, drives the most part of the energy. No, I think it's I think it's a very important point to make and uh, I originally uh, proposed the seminar presentation on the on the uh, structure transformation mm -hmm. and uh, but I suppose that the capital Chinese Chinese economic growth is more 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 intriguing so <laughs> I, I switch it but anyway the the point that the transformation of uh, say demand manufacturization, is a very important part of the uh, Chinese growth to, to, to talk about the Chinese uh, future growth. How can we smoothly transform from uh, well, uh, manufacturing to other related services is very important. Like uh, financial sector, real estate sector, construction sector, and uh, manufacturing sector. And uh, well, we, we observed a very aggregate capital accumulation, one good. 
but the um, reality is um, uh, it's far from one good. And the Chinese transformation is very rapid. When I say 1990s and uh, 20, 2020, we have a very different economies. But um, we can't tell with the one, one, one single good economic growth model to look at the how the allocation of resources will uh, lead to the efficiency of investment or uh, TFP growth. And uh, I assume that uh, capital accumulation is almost complement to uh, TFP growth. They are not separable. But um, how to allocate? Which industry must be emphasized? Well, we can't tell from this uh, very simple uh, growth model. But it's the important part. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, we found Professor Hata. Hata Sensei, Dodo. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for a very clear presentation and also uh, the fact that the uh, capital accumulation played a very important role in the growth is very convincing. On the other hand, uh, as I remember, um, according to the very old uh, study, by Shinohara-san and, uh, and uh, Asako-san uh, in uh, late 1990s, they attribute the, uh, uh, well, sort of, uh, uh, they studied the total factor productivity and the, uh, they used the data between 1955 and 68 in Japan. And they say that the, uh, of the average 10% growth, uh, about 55% uh, can be, 5.5% uh, uh, can be uh, uh, explained by total factor productivity. And the capital accumulation explains less than uh, uh, 3%. And so uh, th that was the data I remembered. And the now I just uh, uh, checked my uh, computer and the, uh, I recall that. And so my question is whether that study, kind of rather old study, is now uh, outdated or uh, is, uh, was it a kind of uh, particular case of Japan and not that of uh, China? That's uh, my question. Okay, thank you very much. I, I I just uh, look over the Japanese case for this uh, growth competition, the de decomposition in 1960 through 1990. The Japanese GDP per capita growth is 5.7 uh, percent. Out of them, TFP 1 percent and uh, capital accumulation 2.8 percent, etc. So that um, uh, well, these these figures could these figures depends on the uh, uh, model. And, but uh, this is a very textbook like standard or uh, very simplistic uh, neoclassical growth model. I see. Well, and uh, it, it, it explains uh, very well about the, the US growth too, and Japanese growth too. And uh, sometimes in recent, not, not Shinohara san's uh, era, but um, uh, loss of decades, so called loss of decades in Japan. 1990s on, uh, sometimes this is due to uh, TFP slowdown, TFP growth slowdown, or uh, this is due to the uh, uh, less and less capital accumulation. And yeah. it tells, in the case of this uh, framework, a very, very low TFP growth and very low capital accumulation and come up with that. This yes. is uh, actually, actually uh, Asako-san and shinohara -san also point out that between 74 and 98, uh, 89, uh, you know, after the uh, oil shock, the, uh, uh, the uh, total factor productivity dramatically dropped to, uh, to around 1%. Uh -huh. And the, while uh, during the peak growth period, it was uh -huh. well over 5%. Uh -huh. And so uh, I kind of remember that, you know, this... Uh, uh, sort of uh, phenomena of uh, uh, the kind of lowering the economic growth rate 
reduces the uh, uh, total factor productivity right. growth. And the, somehow um, uh, China was growing very rapidly, but still, you know, uh, the total factor productivity growth and the contribution of that was not that big. It was sort of uh, interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, the uh, sort of uh, somehow different uh, question is that the uh, when I saw this uh, Asako Shinohara study, I thought that the you know part of the reason is uh, for the dramatic drop in the total factor productivity was uh, uh, sort of due to the lowering of economic growth, but maybe uh, industrial structure also changed too, and the uh, at least this period was kind of before the digitalization. And so uh, when the uh, industrial structure moved toward the uh, kind of tertiary uh, industry, then the kind of uh, uh, really uh, in, so te technological innovation in the sense of uh, improving machines and so forth was uh, not uh, uh, important at that time. And, uh, and so in general, I would think that the, uh, depending upon the industrial structure, the contribution of capital uh, as compared to the total factor productivity would, would, would be different. And the, is that type of uh, uh, sort of uh, industrial, difference taken into account in these types of uh, studies. Thank you. I, I, uh, your, your point is exactly what I am going to do. <laughs> I see, I see. So, so, so that, um, uh, like in the case of uh, agriculture, for example, well, mm -hmm. if we look at the American U.S. agriculture uh, structural uh, development, it shows a very huge shift in uh, Input input components from uh, labor labor land to uh, to uh, what uh, intermediate goods like uh, chemical or physical and what botanical. <laughs> so uh, this uh, factor composition change within the industry also and the industrial structural change both uh, were contributed to this uh, this aggregate uh, economic growth. So that uh, we we can walk into the depths of this uh, single world economy to that, and that, that is one point. And also another point is that um, uh, maybe 19th, in the case of for example Japan, 1960 to 1990, I I I chose this this period for international comparison. But uh, if we can get into a 1950, 60, 70, 80, 90, etc. So that um, uh, well, it depend if we go into each individual country's context, we better uh, be careful about uh, the, the period choice. Well, because that um, uh, the, there is uh, some uh, rapid, rapid and slow transformation during that process. So that um, your point is uh, well taken. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you very much. I learned a lot about I can hardly hear. Hard to hear, he said. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. No, this is my feeling. Uh, 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 <laughs> and uh, my question is that uh, sorry if I miss missed some, some points, but uh, I wonder just uh, in the future, the, the relative importance of TX 
the P mm. compared to the um, capital investment. Mm. And uh, I know that some literature uh, said that the success of Chinese economy for the um, these uh, less developing countries. Mm. And I just wonder if from this uh, today's presentation, how can what is the implication for other developing countries and can they also learn uh, from uh, this uh, capital accumulation? Uh, sorry, this is okay. Uh, my question. Um, your, your question remind me the the additional problem goes up um, uh, more and more capital accumulation is found in the case of invisible capital these days. So that um, uh, like in the like in, in the case of uh, agriculture, the R and D is more important. So that um, uh, uh, we 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 used to be the very very happy period. We can measure investment in capital accumulation very easily by counting the number of machines. But it's not very easily countable. Measure social capital. Uh, <laughs> social capital or invisible capital or knowledge capital, or how, how do you call it? But, but anyway, measurement problems becomes very serious. And uh, probably every economy is getting into that direction. So it, it suggests that um, uh, neoclassical growth model is, is it's not very, very well reserved in, in this case, because the measurement problems are data, how, how we, can, we can measure the, the, the impact of data. And uh, someone says that knowledge is, knowledge is, uh, knowledge capital is uh, what, uh, non-rival. But it, it doesn't mean that um, they are free because platform enterprises monopolize them, one, one of them. And so that um, uh, I would say that um, uh, knowledge capital could be, yeah, knowledge capital is essentially non-rival, but it's not free to choose, free to use. No, no developing economies can use the knowledge capital. So that um, uh, the, the Actually, accessibility is very limited. They say, well, uh, theoretically, it's non rival, but it's viable. And uh, we can exclude every user. Or uh, we, there is a strong incentive to, to exclude the accessibility to the, to the knowledge capital. So that um, data management and the governance of data, etc is becoming important, but um, we are not, not a consistent idea of how to correctly manage those uh, invisible capital. So uh, up to now, the capital accumulation is easy to see, but it's becoming invisible and invisible. That's another, another question. So we, we, can, we can talk about easily, the, relatively easily about the past, but future. <laughs> There's a very famous question. Like John Robinson, what is capital? <laughs> <laughs> and it's the, the, the decomposition of the capital and also the labor. Decomposition is very, very important. Mm -hmm. If we consider the uh, capital into the very precise part, the maybe uh, some total capital productivity contribution of that would be very very small because the the the, the technology is uh, uh, involved into the capital itself. Yeah, uh, right, right. Uh, and also uh, uh, in the case of labor, the uh, education is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, human capital, mm -hmm. accumulation of mm -hmm. human capital is involved in the. Uh, 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 labor quality. But in the case of, of uh, labor also, if we look at uh, uh, you know, very uh, uh, many you know, classes of labor, uh, 
skilled labor, and, yeah. and not only unskilled labor and labor, uh, skilled labor, but into many, many categories. Then the technology for human capital uh, accumulation would be embodied into the such class. Yeah, so yeah, the, yeah. to measure the total factor productivity is a very, very difficult. But anyway, what, 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 what we see here, for example, uh, is that um, there is no backward bending. The path is always to, to the northeast. It means that um, without capital accumulation, no, no TFP growth. Yeah, like, like in the case of human capital. When you invest in human capital, then we can, we can enhance TFP. So it's not the backward bending. That it shows that it could be steeper. Well, actually, interesting thing is the U.S. becomes steeper in this country. Well, with the with the with the, the same amount of capital accumulation, they enhance. They are successful in enhance the productivity. So what well, we call it TFP, or anyway, but um, without capital accumulation, no. TFP growth. Thank you so much for your presentation. I have one question about the decomposition of per capita GDP growth. So, according to your result, we see that labor participation contributes like much less to the economic growth compared with GDP and the capital accumulation. And I'm wondering if the reason because because the example that you just mentioned, like in US agriculture, decrease in the labor participation, but increase the usage of chemical. Or maybe the other possible example is like decrease in labor participation, but increase the usage in AI. Like what what's your opinion in like labor participation does it contribute like as much as the other two factors and should we be worried about that? Well, well of course the one is uh, the gender discrimination. Well in the case of Korea, probably the, the, the women's participation increase. That's one, one thing. The other one is uh, people become healthier. They can work in the old age, older age. Uh, so that um, uh, both these uh, social discrimination aspects and uh, more healthier, well, quality change in popu uh, demography will enhance the labor participation. Well, it's not, net, it's not a labor, labor economics story. <laughs> okay. So actually, uh, when we look at the active, no, sorry, what should I say? The economically active population share, we found that uh, in, in poor economies, uh, if we define the, the active population as a, as a uh, uh, say, we, we define the, the so-called kind of uh, actual retirement age at say 12 years backward from the, from the life expectancy. Well, in the case of uh, low income economies, life expectancy is very short. So that um, active working population is very small. Young is many, but the old is less. So that um, uh, as a result, uh, the advanced economies has more richer in active population, especially say 80s, 90s, even even to, uh, the, in the first decade of the uh, 21st century, rather than developing countries, because their life expectancy is small. And if we say, uh, if the life expectancy is 65 years old, then active age limited 55 years. But if it becomes 95 years old, sorry, probably it's too, too much. <laughs> 85 years, 85 years old, send 75 is the maximum to be active. 
in that case, we have an uh, ample active population. So active population, which is advanced economies characteristics. That's one thing. And of course, uh, the social problems, gender discrimination, and uh, say uh, breaking the, the glass ceilings, that also affect that's labor participation uh, events. Uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Tosca, uh, can I ask you to return to table two on um, slide 20, table two? I want to confer some data. Which is table one? Table, table two. two. Table two on slide 22. Oh, this, yeah. yeah uh, it seems that there's some strand data in this table. Uh, for example, uh, uh, labor participation mm. for USA. First, I want to confirm whether this uh, labor participation referred to uh, percentage of labor in the total uh, labor force. Employment per population. Population. Mm. So the unit is a percentage, not a number, not a person. Unit is ratio. Ratio. How how so so that um it's a uh, well it's it's if this this is it this is it labor yeah. over total population but la labor leisure it I think it cannot stand for the labor import so labor import labor import capital import labor import. No, 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 no. This, this is only, only, only leisure. Is this, this is employment. employment. Yeah. We are talking about table two. Table two, not this. Yeah, table. yeah. Well, well, the same one. Same one? Same one. Because we, we look at the upward trend of uh, in L. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the, this is the, this part, labor participation effects. But and I think only labor participation. If, yeah, so, so, the labor union participation is this. It the cannot stand for the, the labor season. import. Huh? We have we have variable uh, kept import, kept accumulation, but there are no labor import. If only percentage, the only leisure is cannot reflect the the real situation of labor import in the country. Oh, oh, there is no labor accumulation. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> of course, it's it's a it's a labor stock. Labor, labor stock, stock. Yeah. labor stock, employment stock. Yeah, if you see, you are talking about labor stock, mm -hmm. the unit should be number of person, not percentage. Number number of person divided by number of population. So that mm -hmm. is a ratio. So uh, say 50% uh, or 55% is as well. In the case of China, this is China. So the, it's more than 55%, very high mm -hmm. labor participation. Korea, Korea is uh, this one. It shows a very significant increase from 1965, about uh, less than 30% to uh, more than 50%. What I want to say is that if a country's labor force is uh, stable, labor participation can, say, can experience some thing. But if the labor force itself is changing, the labor participation is not so important. We should uh, pay more attention to the the real number of labor. For example, in case of you, 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 you're talking about the the possible labor force. Yeah. Well, we we're talking about the employment. What was yeah, uh, I know, I know. I, I no, uh, number of persons who, I who, who earn wages. Such kind of uh, exile in, uh, years ago. Islam. So, uh, in the original model or Soros model, yeah, he divided the economic growth rate into three uh, sources. Say, import, the, in, uh, the contribution of labor import, contribution of capital import, and the contribution of GDP. Mm -hmm. So, what I want to say, as I, I said just now, if a country's labor force is uh, Stable, uh, okay. you your consideration to pay attention to labor passive participation mm -hmm. is okay. Mm -hmm. 
But if the labor force itself is changing significantly, we should pay attention to the real number of labor uh, and its growth rate. So in, in this table, it's a little strange. Right? Uh, if we consider the case of the United States, mm. for the period of, from 1990 to mm. 2019, mm. the labor negative. is yeah, yeah. negative. Mm. It cannot show real situation about the difference of the United States. United States case, probably, if we look at the United States labor participation rate here, this is the black one here. Mm. Okay, through 1990 to uh, 2019, the level is going down. Yeah, labor participation according is to your, going your down. Calculation, yeah, the results are negative, but cannot reflect the real situation of the labor growth situation in the United States. In our image, the labor force is increasing in the United States compared to other developed countries. <laughs> yeah, of course, your situation may be right. Maybe, maybe, maybe we discuss the individual. Yeah. <laughs> uh, similarly, but of course, but mm -hmm. I, I would say that um, if we pick up the 1990 level of uh, labor participation here, mm -hmm. okay, here to here, the slight decline from here. But if we look at from here to here, labor participation increased. So of course, that uh, it's it depends on the uh, the two endpoints. Beginning of the period and end of the period. We are looking at the two, just the two two point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, if we measure the three <laughs> changes, then uh, it will distort the the uh, real picture. But uh, fortunately, we will see some uh, very oh, uh, in a, in a, in a, in the long run, we see some simple upward trend or downward trend or staple. Okay, uh, and we in front of this table, we, we also can find the two other stranger data. Uh, for them, so what? Well, sorry, in, in the case of TFP, <laughs> TFP. in yeah. case of uh, mm. Taiwan and Korea, mm. there are two negative data uh, for the recent two decades. TFP growth, two yeah. Decades. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little difficult to explain. No, no, TLP could be negative or positive. Yeah, because if it exists in many developed countries, but in case of Taiwan and Korea, no, even though but, but if there is a kind of uh, uh, kind of idly idle of uh, capital use mm. because of the uh, demand demand stagnation, then the stock cannot cannot be used wasted. So, so that it will be requesting negative TLP growth. It's natural. Uh, so it's just a reflect the utilization of capital. In many developed countries, such a phenomenon existed. But in East Asia country, we say their economic growth rate is accompanied by, accompanied by the growth, growth of TFP. For actually, for three decades of Taiwan and Korea, we mm. cannot say these two economic experiences are negative TFP growth. Mm. It's a, uh, at, at least it's a difficult to explain. So that um, capital stock is uh, misused or uh, underutilized. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Underutilized. Maybe, yeah, maybe yes. Well, that could happen. Mm. In, in the situation. Ah, of course. Process. Okay. You may you may be able to point out that um, if we pick up just the end point and the big, at end, beginning of the period point, mm. then we may neglect the, the changes in between. But anyway, well, if we look at the uh, annual figures, for example, the utilization could be negative and positive. No, no, no utilization, not, not 100% or 80% or just 70 Based on two points, maybe mm -hmm. uh, there will appear a negative growth rate. But maybe if you use the average rate growth rate of TFP, maybe you can avoid it. But if you, if you assume that TFP is by definition must be positive, you, you are wrong. Mm -hmm. TFP is kind of a residual. Yeah, I know. So, so, I, so I, that it could be, so it could be yes. negative. Yeah. <laughs>
no, nobody said you are wrong <laughs> in the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's an informal meeting, so <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, anyway, we can continue to discuss uh, oh. after the uh, seminar. Any other question or comments? Additional additional figure. Well, this is the. Oh, this is the. Uh, GDP relative to U.S. Well, but I just looking at the world development it indicates so mm -hmm. for until twenty twenty two. We see this period, the GDP relative to US, China is here, and Japan, uh, Korea. This is general, uh, the total size. Excuse me? Total size of GDP. Uh, total GDP, total GDP. This is GDP per capita mm -hmm. relative to US, and China here, and Japan here, and Germany here. Mm -hmm. And uh, as well as to as to the uh, uh, WDI figure, well, this is a constant 20, 2015 US dollars by the market exchange rate. But uh, we we see some uh, newspaper article that uh, Germany exceeds Japan now in in GDP. That's the yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, uh, as far as this, this uh, WDA figure is concerned, it's German still here, and Japan is here, it's a but China is here, of course. And current uh, exchange rate. Mm -hmm. This is a current exchange rate, uh, market exchange. Uh, market. market exchange. And uh, 2015, 2015 constant US dollars, not PPP. Yeah, you mentioned it's measured in mm -hmm. PPP. The... But as I as I as I suggested in the beginning, you see these economies are exceptional. So it it can it can take any shape, divergence or convergence or sometimes divergence, sometimes convergence. Yeah, uh, I agree with what you say. China is not only one, but the, the group of Asian country, East Asian country. Mm -hmm. But you see that economists are, <laughs> economists are short eyesighted. <laughs> so that um, they forget about the 1960s. 1960s, they remember what well, Japan is, Japan is exceptional. 70s, Korea is exceptional. Now, China is exceptional. They forget about the, the, the past ideophobia. I remember say, when I was a student, we had a lot of discussion about the miracle of Japan's <laughs> economy, to from the, particularly in May year. Good, good old days. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, in case of Japan, also uh, the case of uh, China, uh, Korean, uh, Taiwan, the, the one of the uh, success is uh, uh, to have an uh, uh, open economy system. Yeah. So, the, so the, uh, in other words, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan are very lucky uh, to have a very open mind market, oh, yeah, yeah, particularly yeah, yeah. in the right, United States. Right, right. But also uh, in Europe, mm -hmm. some uh, 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 technologies uh, for manufacturing. Just as a, 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 a very obsolete at that time in Europe. Mm. However, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan could adopt new technology mm. developed uh, by the uh, United States and other areas. Mm. So, these kind of the uh, yeah, 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 yeah. black. Yeah, yeah, you are very correct. We, we <laughs> leapfrogged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of. So, yeah. the, my question is that uh, uh, we used to say that. Uh, 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 imports uh, substitute policy was wrong. Mm. Uh, that's that was true. Mm. But it, uh, you know, openness or globalization policy uh, is not uh, 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 sufficient condition. It's a no. necessary condition. So the, in the case of uh, you know, for uh, including China mm. and for Asian country, uh, East Asian country. 
Tôi đi tắc kỳ. Nói rồi, rồi, rồi. So they, uh, but they, we should have, we should give some uh, message to uh, listen to, you know, uh, uh, developing, other developing countries, mm -hmm. that uh, Kumasan, you know, raised mm -hmm. the question. So they, uh, Globalization, uh, but they, now they are very much, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, anti movement uh, to the globalization mm -hmm. because of the Trump and uh, as a uh, very uh, domestic, uh, you know, mind uh, politicians and also some uh, uh, geopolitical uh, crisis. So they uh, are risks. So, Global, uh, globalization would be slowed down, mm. maybe. Mm. So the, in this condition, say, uh, what is uh, a good policy for uh. developing countries to mm. get more involved? I'd like to have your well, it's a, It's question. too too difficult for me to answer. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 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 the important point uh, is that um, uh, we have to take account of the uh, the external conditions to each individual experiences. Say uh, technology levels, technology changed 1960s and uh, 2010s, and also the policy framework. Say international policy frameworks changed, and also in the case of China, probably China is too big. I mean, the the main difference between China and the other East Asian economies is the size, its impact on the world economy. Well, Japan was marginal. Korea, Korea and Taiwan was marginal. But China is not. That's a very different difference. Very, very true, important difference between China and non-China East Asian economies. And uh, the globalization trend of political geographic, uh, political geography. Nobody has answers, but um, uh, well, but anyway, we must cope with the, the status quo, the status quo, and uh, Putin is Putin, right? And uh, Putin supported by some of the global south. That's a reality. And uh, so that the um, international transaction is, is uh, hampered by this movement. And uh, how long it will continue, we can't tell. So of course, that, um, it's a good chance for writing uh, many papers about the, the what, if we have this kind of obstacle, what we can do is this or that. Okay, Dr. Pan. <laughs> Yeah. Professor uh, Kosova, thank you very much for your enlightening presentation. And I have a very, maybe very basic uh, question. And could you please turn to page eight? Slide eight. So, eight. Slide eight. 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 Yeah. Uh, you see? Yeah, you mentioned in the beginning. That that again, please. Page, which page? This one. Oh, this page. This is what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, at the beginning, you have mentioned that uh, there are some kind of associations uh, they come on said about the inequities about the China system. There was a well-functioning financial system, uh, a strong institutional framework for market oriented. Now that's what the China is mm -hmm. that for. And uh, I uh, noticed that in the conclusion you uh, still that they are something China does not have as a better than that we are having. And uh, I, 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 my, my question uh, is that um, what are the, are you imagining, can you explain more about the, what the uh, well-functioning financial system might be like and what a, a strong institutional framework might be like. <laughs> uh, about the uh, market-oriented economy, I think many people are talking about how state-owned state uh, enterprises are uh, in party 
uh, are playing too much role in the economy of China. And besides that, is there any other uh, things that China can work on to solve such kind of problems? Uh, sorry, my question might be quite basic. <laughs> well, I I wonder if I can uh, answer you correctly, but um, uh, well, this is a open set remarks about the well-functioning financial systems lacking, but um, uh, what is well-functioning financial system is a very, very radical question, all right? And in the case of uh, Korea, Taiwan, and even in Japan in the, in the post-war period, the financial system is uh, government-guided. And uh, whether the guidance is wrong or correct is uh, very debatable. So in the case of Japan, uh, uh, Charles Johnson says that um, uh, well, Japanese government uh, well made a correct choice, but there are very different opinions too. But anyway, the the, the fund allocation was controlled or managed by the government or public sector, and uh, so we can say, Charles Johnson said that uh, because of this uh, uh, the guidance. We were successful, the Japanese economy succeeded. But someone says that despite the <laughs> this public intervention in the financial alloc allocation, well, say the, for example, uh, Sony had not been helped by the government financially or uh, operationally. They made it without, without the public intervention. Well, so, so in that in that case, Sony is despite the government intervention case. And uh, but anyway, we had much departed in the in the banking banking system in in the in the in the China in China, and those allocations are very very biased for public enterprises. So in that sense, the the financial system is not uh, uh, market market determined. But the uh, market determined financial system sometimes uh, what, uh, take a wrong way, <laughs> as we can see in the in the many many financial bubbles. In the case of Japan in 1980s, for example, Japanization is one of them. So that uh, what is well functioning financial system is like uh, one very important and. Uh, Debatable issue, but so so that it's a often often stated uh, uh, observation. Growth without well-functioning markets, but um, it's debatable. So first of all, there is a... but of course that we we know that the government of government manipulated the financial system. Had used to work in the case of Korea, for example, in Taiwan, 1960s and 19, even 1970s. But it seems it's okay because of this uh, fund allocation. They are they are uh, well uh, light light manufacturing industries uh, succeeding in exports. So that it's it's a kind of uh, after story. And uh, so that's it's a very textbook like statement. It has it has done all this without a well functioning financial system. Then it's well functioning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's, that's very you know, I, 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 I enjoy the discussion here because of them. this is the seminar. This yeah. is the true true purpose of seminar. Okay, we we can say anything, right? And we we are invoked uh, from everywhere. Uh, we still have some time to for the passing. Gaibu kala mo oku na kata san ka sarete ru to mo imasu ga. Gaibu na kata liu sen shita in desu ga. Ko shitsumon to comment arimasu ka? Nihongo demo dozo. えっと、ほ、ほ、あの、コース先生日本語は上手ですので、得意です。<笑><笑><笑>
質問したい方いらっしゃるでしょうか。えー、ないようです。もうみんな疲れちゃう。はい、えー、っと、えー、そうですねあの、まだ質問したい方いるかもしれない,しれないですけどもあの、えーっと、ほぼ2時間になりましたので、えー、っと、今日のセミナーをこの辺で終了させて、終了したいんですが、いいですかはい、あの、コス先生にもう一度、もう一度が初めて来てましょう。ありがとうございました。お疲れ様でした。ありがとうございました。